Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. Just came in from my final night out in Houston for a while. I'm pretty much going to be out of town the rest of July. So I wanted to get as many videos in the hopper as possible. I'm just still so backed up. But I wanted to address today some music clips of that million dollar audio system and give you my commentary. Because again, as I've mentioned before, the mic can only capture so much, especially when you get to the level of systems that I'm recording and what they specialize in, the dynamics and the texture of the bass, the delicate details of a plasma tweeter, all these things I'm going to talk about in a minute. You just can't pick up through a any kind of recording, much less a cell phone recording. So I want to give you a little bit of perspective of what my takeaways are to put it in context. And But in the interim, I wanted to tell you some other stuff that's coming. Not only am I backed up with all the other stuff I'm doing, uh, I still have that inacoustic power conditioner. It's actually below my feet right now. I actually um, did my second stage of testing, which is to take it out of my system and see how much I miss it. That's kind of, a lot of people just do primitive reviews. They put it in, tell you what they hear, and then they're done with it. But really what I've found over the years, and especially with power conditioners works really well, is to analyze the difference that you can hear Get a good feel for it with a lot of tracks and specifically identify where things change. But then also take it out of your system and then see how much you miss it or not. You can do that with almost any piece. And that, a lot of subliminal things is what I'm going to tell you made it, makes a difference to me and what you should actually look for in reviews if people share it. So I'll have a lot of that in the future. But again, I'm too backed up and I'm not going to be in town much the rest of the month to get to that. The other thing that came in today, though, super excited about is the Blue Hawaii headphone amp that I told you about at the Florida Audio Show, that one of the best things I've ever heard was the Blue Hawaii headphone amp with the Stax SR9000. Now, those are still back ordered till November, but 3MA became a dealer for both, and they finally got the head amp in, the Blue Hawaii, and man, that piece is gorgeous. And the build quality, you can even see under the hood a little bit, it's just impeccable. Uh, it's a showpiece, super high quality. I'm going to have a video all on that. And I'm going to test it with another Stax headphone that's a little further down the line uh, and give you some impressions on that soon. So two things that are in the hopper on top of still stuff I got backlogged um, that I promised in the past. But getting back to the Million Dollar Audio System, I wanted to touch on a few things that were takeaways for me that you won't get from the music clips that I'm going to put in a second video today. Both are going to be released today, this one and that one. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the rooms because that's probably one of the things that at least I noticed at first when I went into that room with the million dollar speakers and probably you could even pick up in the interviews and, and whatnot. There's not a whole lot of treatments in there and it's a little bit higher reverb than what normal audiophile rooms have. But... This is why you need to be there and also understand what somebody's trying to accomplish and what types of music. Because here's the fallacy that I see in the hobby by experts, even acousticians that I see on these other channels. They'll, draw, they'll be even put up these fancy graphics with a square or rectangular room and have everything mapped out and say 15% should be diffusion, 15% should be this, and all of that stuff. And quite frankly, it's nice. It's great. It sounds awesome but it's so bad. it's actually so primitive that I almost want to shake them. It's like, are you really thinking sound behaves that way? Because what you can draw a rectangular box, but guess what? Number one, it's never showing what sofas, other things are in there. What's one, what, what sides have some windows, some don't. What sides have bookshelves and some don't. It's never this square box, okay? Maybe if you're doing a build out of a home theater. But for audio files, in most 99% of the cases, uh, even in my room here, it's not a perfect square. And you can't just do things in a little diagram. And as I've said many, many times before, even what's inside, if that's perfectly square or rectangular, sound sees your walls different than your eyes do. On this side of my wall, I have a brick wall. On the other side of the drywall, it's totally open to a hallway and a bathroom. Sound is going to look at these walls different, even if you can draw it symmetrically on a diagram. You have to actually listen. And then on top of that, in this person's case, you have to listen to what they're trying to accomplish. As he mentioned, he's trying to accomplish 
an or he plays mostly orchestra, and he's trying to accomplish and capture act everything that the mic captures. And certainly with acapella, plasma tweeter, you're capturing everything. You're getting every minute detail, and so liquid and pure. That's one of the strengths I'll tell you that you probably can't pick up. That plasma tweeter is exceptional, probably one of the best in the world, if not the best. Uh, there are some trade-offs to having a plasma tweeter, but if it costs no object, you don't mind having to replace it maybe every four or five years, depending on usage, and having to plug it in. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a massless, it's a little flame you can actually see. I don't know how much you could pick up on the video, but you should see like a little bit of blue or light in there, and that's a kind of almost a flame, plasma flame, that creates the sounds, massless tweeter. You can look up some more information if you haven't ever heard it or understand what that's all about. But in any case, when he's capturing everything in minute details from the microphone, you also have to factor in your head the fact that, well, sometimes these concerts, and in most cases, even studio recordings, are mic'd really close to the instruments. And sometimes they don't have an ambient mic or an omni mic capturing the venue as much. So when he combines the ability of his system to pick up all those minute details, like the conductor hears, as he mentioned, or the mic picks up, then also his room naturally adds the reverb that is very similar because of that size of that room and the massive ceilings. It actually sounds in many ways more realistic to what his goal is trying to get than if he had a super highly damped room like my room. I prefer a room highly damped. I listen to a lot of studio recordings. I don't sweat trying to recreate a venue because I rarely see live music as it is. And when you go see the bands I go watch live music, it's usually I'm hearing it from a PA speaker off axis anyway. I'm not hearing each instrument. And if you look on stage, they're miking the, the guitar amps and the, the drums right on. So this, there's a fallacy with uh, sound staging uh, when you analyze gear, that being too high a priority or getting too fooled by that. And there's also a, a fallacy in terms of what type of reverb is correct for each person's taste. In, in not every case should you have one formula for all music or for all goals. And in his case, he likes a little more reverb and it totally works for him. The other thing that I noticed, even though I didn't prefer that higher reverb, uh, even with the orchestra where I was initially seat, sitting, I noticed he had one of those, he has roller chair and he had a plastic uh, protecting the wood floors so you could move it. And all I did was move my chair as I was listing more and more up six inches. Um, and sure enough, as soon as I moved six inches up, I was getting to that level of direct um, on axis that negated a lot of some of that room echo and reverb that may be a little too much for certain taste. You can also adjust that by just your seating position. Uh, certainly, if you're way back, way off axis, you will get different uh, reverbs um, and different presentations that could be more or less attractive to you. But even when you notice when we did the interview and he moved from one position in the room to another position, his voice had different reverb and picked up on the mic. So, again, don't always sweat everything you see in the room and make knee-jerk conclusions. Listen to the goals, listen to all that's happened, and also where the position is that you're listening. Because direct on axis versus off axis, different areas could make the reverb a more uh, negative situation versus a positive. And so that's one of the takeaways that educated me as well, that I, I got to be careful not to make knee-jerk conclusions when I see a room. There is going to be additional treatments, probably a little light treatments uh, in those rooms. But again, nothing substantial because as it is right now, he's getting the performance that he, his goal was. Now, what is another takeaway that I had from that day out there? Well, I had a dogma that I thought in this hobby of diminishing returns. You know, I feature a lot of expensive gear, but then I can come home to something that's much more modest and say, yeah, I'm pretty much there as well uh, at a much lower cost. But... In, in some cases, that's blown out the window. Uh, and in the case of that, that 
house that we visited, he has two systems, almost identical electronics, maybe one level down in the electronics in that cabana room with the acapella Trilon speakers versus acapella spherons. But I played the same song on both. And boy, you would think that diminishing returns would be very slight, albeit different rooms, but even tape factoring that in, there was no competition whatsoever. The Spherons were just so much better, so much more dynamic, so much more real. And again, in that room. But it made me believe him more when he said that he's fooled people with $2,000 bookshelves in that room because I can actually see in that cabana room, the smaller room with the trilons, that some people may be fooled or may want one versus the other. Spherons, no. <laughs> That's tremendous dynamics, uh, just the level of, it's just a, a whole nother level that is not that extra one or two or five percent that people talk about when diminishing returns while you're spending the extra money. No, when you do get to that Spheron level, it's more than one, two, five percent. And you know, in my case, it's, it, I would judge it at least 40 percent better in that room. And more importantly, it, it, if I had cost no object money, I would easily spend the million on the Spheron versus the Trilon, you know, and I wouldn't bat an eye about it. And I normally wouldn't say that. Normally, even if I had all the money in the world, I would still like to be somewhat frugal and responsible and say, oh, if I got 95%, that's good enough. But no, this is not close. Uh, so that was a big takeaway. I don't know how much is going to come across in these videos. Quite frankly, I haven't even listened to the audio. I just go by what I heard live and hopefully it comes out because even what if I listen to the recordings beforehand, what I'm listening to on my headphones may be different than what you're listening to. So it, it's really going to be different for each of you, depending on your playback. But hopefully you enjoy. Hopefully you've enjoyed this whole series and appreciate a little more than just me showing you cool gear. Some takeaways that you can extrapolate in your own journey versus just wishing you had a million dollars. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned at any budget from this day that I spent there and hopefully I shared some of those with you. So without further ado, go to the next video I upload today and that's going to have the music clips.